Hey everyone, this is Andy Moore and I am here with the fabulous orchestra members of the Lubbock Chamber Orchestra and DJ Spar, composer. I wanted to talk to you about Hard Metal Cantus. This is his new release, his album coming out in November. And we have these orchestra members who will tell us a little bit about their piece that they did together on the album with every gust of wind. How did you come up with the hard metal classical concept? Oh yeah, well that's, it's just, I think it's just that I play guitar my whole life and you know there are composers that, um, and with great respect to them, they, they take like, they grew up playing Brahms and Chopin and all this stuff and they like modernism and Strauss and WC and all this stuff and then they're like oh let's put like a rock beat under it. But I actually was always just playing with a rock beat from the time well, literally fifth grade. I was in a band in fifth grade. We played the township, you know, so, uh, but then I learned about the classical stuff later. So the idea of like the hard metal, which in this piece is kind of related to church bells. And then it's also like there's guitar heavy tracks at the end. And then with Cantus, every, I, I write with a lot of melodic content. So I was, I was just trying to think of like a crafty name. And, um, and actually one time someone said in the last movie of this piece, do I, did I listen to what's now known as classic rock. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, what's classic rock to you is I went and saw Bon Jovi and Van Halen three times and I played it all in bands, you know, at, um, yeah, some, some places that are cool. And, and, um, and it just, it's in there, I don't do it. Also, there's no Google search that has it. So if you put quotes around it, it's the only hit. Uh, so, so, so when you look for the album, it's the only thing that pops up. So. So you guys, tell me a little bit about the um, With Every Gust of Wind. When did you get this piece? Was it pre-COVID or was it during COVID? When did you guys actually start recording? But, you know, this piece came about, um, actually about three years ago, uh, after the formation of the Chamber Orchestra, uh, DJ and I went out for coffee just to talk about music and collaboration and the ideas after we had, after we had just done our debut performance. Um, and uh, we talked about a collaboration uh, in a commissioning project for this piece. And... We specifically at the time, um, this orchestra was functioning as part of Lake Ridge United Methodist Church and Corbin de Spain, um, who was the featured tenor on the piece and uh, Wan Kyung Kim Sills, who's with us right now, um, were my colleagues in, in church music there. And so we wanted to feature them. Um, and they're both uh, virtuosic singers and players and, and just fabulous. And so we wanted to feature them and so DJ, uh, and I began the discussion, and uh, that uh, gave birth to what we have today. Oh, fantastic. You know, um, Dr. Kim Sills, I was just telling her before we came on camera how gorgeous she plays, how she has de such delicate hands. Is it challenging um, to do a piece like this? Um, because it is is not your typical classical piece is contemporary. Right. Um, so tell me, what, were, what was your, you know, experience with the piece? Uh, first of all, it was my very first time when I saw my name on the piece. It was dedicated to us, Corbin and I and Eric at the Chamber Orchestra. So it was a really exciting project for us. And uh, contemporary music could go either really easy or really crazy. Mm -hmm. that I don't even know how to approach. But this was easy to read, but the effect was so maximum. Uh, when we put everything together, I enjoyed a lot, enjoying all the colors put together. Yeah, you, uh, I have to say you all did a wonderful job. Corbin de Spain, de Spain mm -hmm. has a glorious voice, beautiful tenor with this full, robust sound. Um, so, you know, I thought that it all gelled well. Tell me, did you learn the music 
um, did you know the music prior before you know you all recorded or did, were you basically learning it on your feet no I, I did um, we got to premiere that piece about two years before we recorded um, and then I got to uh, premiere it again in Chicago with the Chicago Composers Orchestra yes and so um, yeah I I was really excited because it was another way that we got to uh, reintroduce that and get it worked back up so oh good i mean it sounds so well it sounds like it's in your body because you know sometimes with new music a lot of times we're like learning it on our feet and so yeah. we have the anxiety of trying to get it right um but when i listened to it i was like he sounds like he knew this already um you know but it sounds so gorgeous Corbin came uh, over to my studio at our house in Lubbock and I had written some music out and the first line of music that's in the um, piece, like he sight read that. And he also had told me that he was trained as a counter tenor, if I'm not incorrect. Mm -hmm. so he has this falsetto ability and I was like, well, there is some tradition of that with some of these Karl Orff pieces and stuff like that. So I felt like that was great for the piece and um, he just nailed that. DJs told me that you're getting your master's degree in Cincinnati. Have you made the move? Or are you doing that virtually? What are you doing? Yes, I did make the move. Um, so I'm here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, so I'm very much enjoying it. Um, the talent here is incredible. It's really good to, to cut your teeth with other singers who have that same passion and drive. Yeah. So. Oh, well, thank you so much, Corbin, for your time today. And I mean, I, I cannot wait for the release party because it's going to be yeah. amazing when right. people get to hear you. Yeah. And Thank technically, you. We're, we're technically we're at the release party. It's oh, just, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We, can, we can have fun with that, but uh, make sure you cut that. Yeah. All right, here we are with Nimius Santos, who I uh, I know from Lubbock, Texas. He's a was a graduate student at Texas Tech University, and he was one of the most helpful and nice people to have around. And um, he's on two tracks on this album. He's a principal cellist in the Lubbock Chamber Orchestra recording, and he's also the cellist on a sort of like rock band that we put together. So Nimius, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're up to these days. Okay, thank you so much for having me. And so I'm from, I'm originally from Brazil. I, I met a DJ here at Texas Tech uh, while I was doing my, my DMA in cello. Um, right now, I'm still uh, pursuing uh, another DMA in composition and also a master's in double bass. Uh, I, work, I work at the recording studio here at the School of Music, and I'm, I teach cello at Ebelin Christian University and also at All Saints School here in Lubbock. And so whatever comes on my way, I try to, to so, pursue and try to do it. So to recap, you finished a doctorate in cello. You're doing a doctorate in composition and a master's in double bass. And double you have bass. a job at Abilene Christian and a job at a high, um, the uh, private school in, in Lubbock, the Episcopal yep. School. And you're working for the recording studio at Texas Tech? Yes. All right, Sometimes man. Well, I sleep. I hope you sleep. Yeah, I was just going to say. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, well, the, one of the tracks, uh, the four tracks that we're sort of presenting tonight for the, the, were part of the Lubbock Chamber Orchestra, and you were principal cello on that, correct? Yes. And, um, can I talk about, um, your relationship with Lubbock Chamber Orchestra and how that came, came to be, and maybe if you have any thoughts about the recording project? Uh, I, I started playing the, uh, sub before the Lubbock Chamber, uh, a while ago, maybe two semesters ago. Dr. Allen, uh, the conductor, invited me. And then when the principal cellist moved to, uh, to another city, then I, he invited me to stay to sit down as, as first cello. And it's an amazing experience because it's, a, it's an orchestra that plays from um, you know, Baroque music all the way to really new music, really, you know, like refresh music. And it's, it's really, it's a thrilling experience, a very rewarding experience to work there. Okay, awesome. So that sounds great. And then the other thing that you uh, played on was the um, the last four tracks, which are more like rock and roll 
um, art, art rock, whatever people want to call it. And, uh, and there's this moment right here that we mixed really high in the end. It goes, um, one more time. I love that. So I thought I thought that was so cool. Without you will you have, have become, become this irresistible. irresistible. I, I, I love that piece. I was like, I, I was, I was just having fun, <laughs> just cross genre stuff. It's so amazing, and I mean, just. Like, look at my background. You know, I have a DMA in cello performance with this background in uh, uh, classical music, but I'm working, you know, like this and that, just uh, on a, with technology all the time and we're pursuing other, you know, avenues in music as well. And I just feel, feel so blessed that I was able to participate in that experience. You know, someone that to get me, you know, with my yeah. background and stuff, and could I could participate in that as well. So here we are now with uh, one of my favorite people, David V.R. Bowles, who um, is the head of Swine's Head Productions. And David and I have worked on, this is our third album that we've, put together. And on this album, um, David is co-producer. So that's exciting. And um, what happens is I record all around the country, like as I'm traveling or we're working with players. So uh, from this album, things came in from as far away as uh, we were in Chicago. We did stuff in Lubbock, Texas. But then uh, one of the things I was really excited is we got to use scoring stage at Skywalker Sound, but David did those. And that's... Um, the pieces with the Lee Trio and Del Sol String qu qu uh, Quartet with Michael today. Um, all right, David, so how do you put all this together when I send you all this stuff uh, from over the Dropbox? Well, first of all, the interesting thing was that each of these pieces is very different. Uh, this is not an album where it's a stereotypical, okay, this composer writes in one style. And that's something I've noticed with your work from the very beginning. Actually, um, our working together even predates the recording projects because you had premiere with the California Symphony, which is a full orchestral piece with electric guitar. But obviously, they're recorded in different locations with different scoring, different uh, types of performers. They're vocalists as well as instrumentalists. And the uh, percussion quartet, that's a very special animal right there. So in a way, I'm not expecting them to sound the same, but I did want to bring things together a little bit in terms of having um, a similar sort of cushion of atmosphere around it. Well, it sounds fantastic. So thank you. Well, that's the really trick, nice. everybody, is if you write music and then have great players and then great engineers and a great producer, then it makes you look good. Uh, so um, so what are you working on now and uh, during the pandemic? If I see you're busy and uh, what, what, are, what are some exciting things you want to tell us about? Well, I mean, starting um, starting with Isabel Barak Darian doing Armenian children's music. And we did that uh, with harp, flute, and duduk. And then after that, uh, Bach cantatas with Sherazad Pantaki and Reginald Mobley. And that's with a period instrument group called the Cantata Collective. And then I've done two video projects with Chanticleer, one for Vautis 8 Live from London and one for Stanford Live, which is going to be coming out very soon. Well, David, thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, album 
whatever this is. I, I think of it like it's you know, like a party. Uh, so, um, and we'll stay in touch. And we'll oh, certainly, yes. And more, all, more the, all my best to everybody, the wonderful collaborators, all the yes. musicians who I mixed but didn't meet in person. You know, hopefully we'll work together one of these years. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. Cool. Thank you so much. Well, I'm delighted to uh, welcome the Lee Trio to our event this evening. Uh, Melinda Lee Mazur, pianist, and Angela Lee, cellist. And pretty Hi. soon we're going to see Lisa Lee, violinist as well, <laughs> <laughs> um, who are um, also connected to DJ um, through Avalok and uh, recorded a piece of his, uh, which we will hear later. Uh, so, DJ, perhaps you'll tell us a little bit about this piece. So, it's called Lost in the Old South Tower, and it was written um, at Avalok, started at Avalok. This melody itself is sort of lost in, like, what would be maybe every church tower, like whatever, mm. however you might think, fun, it's kind of a fun idea. And then, so it straddles the, the, the ocean uh, in a way. It's, it's everywhere, but also in the Lee, tri Lee Trio's amazing hands. Lee Trio, any one of you, um, I'd love to hear your feelings about the piece and how it was to work on it and um, anything yeah. you'd like to tell us. When we took a listen to the track, we just were really taken by the piece. It's a short um, piece that has um, such a sort of peaceful ambiance to it. And as you know, Deb DJs like this rock star. <laughs> I, do, I do know. <laughs> um, so um, especially like my part, um, I, he asked the pianist to prepare the piano with um, mutes. And I think it was like four cello, no, four violin mutes and a cello mute. The sound that it produced in the piano was this sort of like gong-like, zen like sort of ring um and it was just it sort of transported us all um in in the short 10 minutes yeah yeah that the sound of the piano at those moments is really striking really striking um Anyone else have anything to say about the piece and learning the piece? And um... For us, it was, I think we had a performance of it a few days beforehand mm -hmm. and trying it out in front of, in front of a live audience. Um, it, well, it made it feel more secure by the time we got to the recording studio. And then just to hear uh, the feedback from, from the audience and that, how much they, the, the music resonated um, with them. I think that that kind of gave us some more confidence going into the recording studio as well. Lisa, how are you? Hi, Deb. Good to see you. And DJ again. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, just me listening to it today, I remembered it was such a flashback. Um, speaking about just the time when we were sitting in the studio, I, it was an, in a way meditative to perform it and to play it, even though we'd stop and do some, you know, short segments of it. But um, it, I thought it was, uh, it was really refreshing to listen to after such a long pause of time and to revisit how um, beautiful DJ. I just <laughs> wanted to say it really captured a magnificent spirit. Um, even visually I can imagine the scene um, and the sparseness carried over in, in multiple dimensions. Um, I mentioned to my sisters when you did bring in you know bits of melody it was perfectly placed and it would you know I, <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm too idealistic but I thought it brought in um, like you could hear the way you use the pentatonics and um, every interval kind of leap or suspension, um, you could hear kind of the land and, and the scenery and the landscape and um, maybe even all the elements of the earth sort of kind of
coming together in a beautiful, seamless way. It was really magical. <laughs> Not complimenting the playing, I'm just saying that the piece, <laughs> the harmonies were really amazing. <laughs> I'll, I'll compliment the playing and then we can just, we can just write that down and quote that. That's good. That's what every, that's what every composer wants to hear, by the way. So I'm sure that the, Those are the liner notes. But, yeah. <laughs> I'll compliment oh, yeah. playing and the piece, <laughs> since I'm on the outside of it. Well, everybody turn down your lights and let's listen to this wonderful piece played by the Lee Trio by DJ Spahn. Wonderful, wonderful to hear this beautiful piece played so beautifully. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much. It's been really a joy to connect to people um, who we've had so much, so much, so many wonderful experiences with at Avalok and to hear your music. So thank you and can't wait to see you again and hear you again um, and stay well. Thanks, Deb. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Did you guys meet on a dating website? Did you meet like, oh. like, like, yeah. like an okay Cupid thing? And, uh, how did you exactly. guys meet? How did this happen? I think uh, so. We were both um, we both ha ended up in Richmond, Virginia, um, for a couple different yeah. reasons. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, I was teaching at Virginia Commonwealth University, and then DJ, well DJ, your wife was uh, uh, playing in the Richmond Symphony Orchestra, right? Yes. And, um, and, and did, did we meet because of like, 
I, 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 I subbed occasionally in the Richmond Symphony no, Orchestra, no. but not regularly. But did we meet through there, or was we it We first else? met at um, Buzz and Ned's Barbecue because you went to hang out with <laughs> Blackbird, and I went to visit. I was hanging out with 8th Blackbird, and you were hanging out with 8th Blackbird, and we met at that, Buzz and Ned's Barbecue. That and is right. I was right. so excited. I was like, maybe there's somebody in town I can get a beer with. That's so funny. You're, 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 <laughs> but, you're totally right. Yeah. So did the piece, like, did it have it, does it have its origins in that time? Or was this like, did you reach out to Third Coast later and say, hey, what do you think about this? Because I see there's a whole consortium, which I'm going to ask about later. But um, yeah, so what? Uh, that's related to the rich living in Richmond. It really was through Peter's position at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Ah, okay. So that's how that. He put it together so he could talk about how that all happened. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I mean, it's it was it was it was a collaborative effort between you know DJ and I, but you know, and that's what we did. And I, I'm actually looking at the list right now, and it's, it's a massive like heavy hitter it's like list. 15, it's amazing. 13, like 15 schools. Yeah, and and I think the the main thing, and I always kind of believe in this, uh, is that you know if you're working with people in your own city, that's that's step one. You know, so um, as an educator, as a pedagogue, like what what I was really excited about was being able to have. DJ in the same room as my students to be able to workshop the piece and to just just have that experience of collaboration between ah. the composer and students. You know, I, I don't think uh, I don't think my bandmates in Third Coast were necessarily aware of like the piece when I brought it to them. Yeah, you know, DJ and I were talking about recording it, so we brought it to them. Everybody gave a listen. They're like, "Yeah, this is great." You know, so um, yeah, that was good. Cool. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so it was uh, it was cool, and it was again, it was I think for me and this, you know. This was like a couple years then after I got to then now approach the piece as a performer. Is it going to be a video too? Like is there like a like a music video type thing or is it just going to be a, There's just uh, out of curiosity not to put anybody on the spot. I'm just Yeah, no, the material oh, didn't cool you hire a bunch of dancers and stuff for the music? <laughs> um there will be, be video really bad, actually. So, <laughs> what I've been doing with the other pieces on the same album is I have uh footage from, from our iPhones and Android phones uh, from the recording session, and those are really good cameras, so I've been putting together, and we'll probably watch one in a few minutes. That you wanted me to ask that I didn't ask? Is there any gossipy, like, drama, like, oh. you know, let's, so you know, sauce it up a little bit kind of thing? Or no, there's no, nothing? No. I mean, one, actually, I will say the neatest thing about this piece. All right. Okay, so everybody, before we listen to it, one of the neatest <laughs> things, one of the neatest things about this piece was when I first went to, uh, from, from moving from Richmond, Virginia to, uh, I went out to California for a concert, and on the way home, I stopped in Lubbock just to find a house uh, to rent from from Kimberly, who was a professor there, uh, now at LSU. But uh, so on the weekend that I stopped in uh, to look at that house, the percussion quartet from McMurray University in Abilene, Texas, was playing at the West Texas Day of Percussion, one town over from Lubbock. So I went and saw them play it, and that to me was just like, whoa, uh, you know, there's your compass. Like that's like, this thing. It's like all kind of crazy. So that's awesome. Uh, that's heat, yeah, right? wild, right? Here we are with Chris Tichiara, and he's the percussionist uh, drummer on the last four tracks of the album called 
The World Within. And uh, we played this piece live. And Chris and I have played a number of things live. We played Steve Mackey uh, with Great Noise Ensemble, Mark Mellitz with Great Noise Ensemble. Uh, so we've played a lot. And um, I, I, I knew f from following your work on on the Facebook and the, and the YouTubes and stuff that you have an excellent recording set up in your house and we're complete with video and everything. So um, since you played this piece already, I thought, why not have you come and uh, add the live tracks to, the, to, to what is the electronic backing track? So um, t tell us a little bit about the experience. Um, well, it was a different experience because you know, when we originally played it, I think I was just given music and I played that and we played it live. And this time around, it was, um, you sent me the audio tracks of the, the sequence sounds. And I realized there were some things that, I didn't think I was gonna be able to play that live in one take. There was some, the way some of the orchestration was with the drum set, it was like, I don't think this is even humanly possible. So I asked you if it was possible to just literally like layer things yeah. and overdub things. So that's pretty much how I approached it. You know, I would do like two hi-hat parts, one on each side that were, you know, mic'd separately and panned so that I could just play those and they would, you know, sound completely panned and like two different people. And then, you know, overdub the Tom thing and then overdub snare and bass drum uh, and overdub you know there was one tune where i was literally just playing choked splash cymbals for the whole right. track so you were actually like a number of session players all in one person <laughs> so it's a pretty much yeah and, and actually that's really I helpful and that's tune, you know, um, i think the only tune was the um that Papa was a rolling stone i forget the subtitle of um that specific piece but that feel was that was probably the main or the only um, time I was, you know, playing completely live because that was a little bit more of a basic part. And it was the hip hop one too, I think. That was the one I was playing completely live. But there was a couple that it was just layer and play like machine. And then whatever happened after, you know, sometimes it's hard to, even though it's acoustic drums and everything, the way it's fit in, sometimes it's hard to figure out the way it's processed. Oh, in the, in the and yeah, I mean, it really is a, an electronic piece. And so, what, like, I, yeah. I mean, I know the human element is there um, because it, without it, it's terrible, you know. So, um, so to have the human element, even though it's all mixed together and intertwined. And uh, I think when we did do it, we probably just played to a click track and, the, and the, that other stuff was out front. And it definitely wasn't like me writing like a drum tr set part. It was just here's like a dream of possible things. So great appreciation from... Yeah from my side uh, to you. Uh, why don't we listen? So uh, let's listen to a couple seconds of this, so. Cool, well that, that, I mean, Chris, thank you so much for, for how that sounds. I, it's, it's a joy to, to hear it. it awesome to work with you um so tell us what what you you got like three or four or 10 15 different projects going on right now tell us um tell us about a couple of them uh well the main one i guess is the um a rite of spring book that i wrote basically about the percussion and timpani parts it's like a how-to guide um it's you know for percussionists timpanists and even for conductors so it's very historical but it's very hands-on and um, I think it would be incredibly useful for for like forever. Awesome. And uh, the other thing was I produced a course, my first course that's for sale on my website. It's um, like 70 minutes of talking about the single stroke roll, which is like the first rudiment we would all play on the drums and how it's applied to everything. Put the links in. Of if you're watching this, they're there. Wherever there is, they're there.
So Alex, basically what happened was, um, I, I know you play acoustic double bass and you're also electric bass and you're a gigger in the Austin area. Um, I sent you some charts and well, what, what did you do with them? Sure, yeah, I just kind of took a look at it and, you know, and I think I did two passes at each one. I did one with electric and one with upright. And I'm actually, which one did you end up using? Did you mix um, and match or? We have mix and match, yeah, so. Okay, uh, but yeah, you know, I just kind of took it, um, you know, some stuff I was a little more gentle when I laid back and kind of played a supportive role, something I was a little more like aggressive rock, you know, put my yeah. Chris Squire hat on. Yeah, and that was, uh, I mean, this was a really great project, too, to uh, kind of use a lot of different influences. Well, I really appreciate you asking me, you know, so, you know, like I said, there was kind of the more laid back traditional bass roll and the rock thing. And then, you know, I grew up as a funk player. So it was oh, really, yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Really nice to kind of use all that in sort of the musical soup. Hi, everybody. Delighted to tonight to have with us DJ Spar, composer and electric guitar virtuoso. So DJ, um, yes. tell us about uh, this uh, actually quintet, us old fashioned people will call it a, uh, a uh, bass quintet that you oh, have. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, this, uh, this piece is called Super String Serenade, and uh, this, this kind of goes with some other pieces I wrote around the same time. I think I was watching a lot of Discovery Channel, and there is this theory of uh, how to mimic or um, model universal properties with small string. Charlton might be able to explain this better than I. But what I liked about it was um, it seems really cool, and there's like it goes with multi more dimensions than we're used to, and it goes with the possibility of possible other worlds or parallel worlds, and that was exciting to me. Um, and it has the word string in it, and that, you know, <laughs> it kind of goes, came up with a title. Well, we're very lucky to have with us two members of the Del Sol String Quartet. Uh, violist Charlton Lee and cellist Catherine Bates, um, who were part of the performance that we're going to hear. Um, so will you tell us a little bit about your process and your relationship with the piece? Well, we, we met DJ, of course, at Avala and uh, shared many a, a drink together there during yeah. meals and, and into the evening, usually sort of the nightcapper. And, and those were often very fruitful sessions where we could discuss music and life and philosophy and, and every which way food and I can't even remember what else but it was quite a few conversations that went on into the night <laughs> yeah um, I can uh, imagine that, I think that relationship and that uh, opportunity yeah. to to network and to hang out was really important to us you know jumping onto this project DJ asked us if we would be willing to record this piece and we said of course um so uh it's not always that we record a piece before we perform it um but in this case that's how it worked so we we knew a fabulous um bass player uh, michael today in the bay area who we knew that we um would want to work with and so we rehearsed it a whole bunch and then i uh, got the opportunity to perform it i mean uh, to record it and it, I think it's just such a at Skywalker. At Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And it was such a fun process, and it's such an amazing and fun piece. Um, and I think what DJ is saying, right? It's it's like it has this energy. It has this sort of amazing, just fun groove. It has this sort of spectrum of sound and um, sort of range because of the bass. For me, I got to. I don't always get to have that sort of base support so it was great to to have that and and yeah it just it was I mean it's such a 
lovely experience to be able to record a wonderful piece with a wonderful composer in a wonderful space um, based on a wonderful relationship that you know, uh, that was made at Avalok. Yeah, um, and there are interesting, various different interesting sounds in it, I, um, just having listened through the recording. Um, and I, I couldn't help but feel, DJ, that there are moments when there's no doubt that you are, there's some electric guitar that sort of Van Halen <laughs> meets Charles Ives or something like that. We recently listened to this again, you know, and it's been it's been a bit of a distance, so it was nice to come back to the piece and it, and we were both laughing and smiling because it's so DJ, it's so you, you know, it's so um, the DNA of it. It's not. It's it's just it kind of bubbles over from your personality, which I love. And like those sounds, I remember working on it, and um, you know, we knew that you had electric electric guitar background, so we knew what these you know, the Ponticello sounds meant what we were going for. And it just was so, um, just so clear. And at the same time, right, the evolution of the piece is just, it feels, it feels like somehow a musical uh, portrait of you, which is, which is fun to listen back to like, oh yeah, like I, I hear you in the piece. Well, I, I think what also was interesting is that the technique, the Ponticello technique, which we're using, playing very close to the bridge in order to get that sort of electric sound, a lot of other composers use that for a more ominous or dark or kind of spooky. Oh, yeah. Just, and with you, it's just like unbridled joy. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we listen to the piece? So, Charlton and Catherine, I'd love to just ask you what Del Sol Quartet has been doing in this crazy time that we've been involved in. I think the big thing um, that we're launching as, as sort of a way to, um, I guess, change, pivot in this season is something we're calling the Joy Project. So we're commissioning short pieces that can be performed um, uh, outside and to inspire joy in our community and we're going around and performing um, in sort of safe but outdoor locations for the community just trying to infuse a spirit of joy uh, in this time and I you know it's amazing listening back to DJ's piece because it's it's like this is what we need right now this is what we need you know I'm a person who loves minor keys I'm a person who loves all this ad stuff but right now I really feel like we all need just a little bit of energy a little bit of spirit 